is a dream Time like a stream Carries our burdens away Never despair Joys everywhere Love can befriend you today Soar above griefs and worries, seek joy and be gay. Scares to the sky. Love is a star, though shining afar. It can guide us and help us toward light to draw nigh. Life is a dream, time like a stream carries our burden. Sometimes a friend helps us ascend up from life's cares to the sky. Love is a star, though shining afar. It can guide us and help us toward light to draw nigh. Love is a star, though shining afar. It can guide us and help us toward light to draw I'd like to welcome you all today to our Sunday service. I am Naya Swami Maria, and we have this special uh, joy of welcoming Naya Swami Asha here from Sacramento. She's been leading a program here. <laughs> That's a habit that just came up out of the past. <laughs> to be from Sacramento, <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> Naya Swami Asha from Palo Alto. I, for many of you, you don't know why we're laughing, but my husband and I were in Sacramento for about 23 years, and that just came out. <laughs> so, at any case, it's our joy to have Naya Swami Asha, and um, I will be reading now from Rays of the One Light, and these are weekly commentaries on the Bible and the Gita, written uh, and put together, put together from Master's teachings by Swami Kriyananda. <clears throat> and this week, it's, uh, we're week 30, it's Do You Need a Guru? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Many people scoff at the idea of having a guru. True to human nature generally, they make a virtue of their scoffing. I am responsible for what I do, they announce. 
responsible for my mistakes as well as for my victories. What would I ever learn if I handed over my development to someone else? To depend on another for guidance would be an act of spiritual cowardice. It would be understandable for someone gifted with some trivial ability, for instance with words, to insist on doing his crossword puzzle himself without letting anyone else help him. But supposing, even in such trivial matters, he had no such gift, what virtue would there be in refusing to learn? For that matter, moreover, where do our gifts come from? They are not a native ability. Still, crossword puzzles are hardly an important challenge. What if a person wanted to do something daring, to climb a cliff, for instance, but refused to study the art of mountain climbing? He would climb at the risk of his own life. And how much more is risked than physical life in the great adventure of the divine search, where the risk is to salvation itself? Where is the sacrifice in seeking guidance? Even a mountain guide wouldn't presume to do one's climbing for one. His purpose would be only to help the neophyte to climb safely. To have a wise guru is not a sign of weakness, but of plain common sense. All the saints, aware as they are of the hazards of the adventure, agree on the importance of having a guide or guru. And these are the heroes speaking, not cowards or spiritual weaklings. Jesus emphasized the importance of having a teacher by asking John to baptize him. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 3, we read on his coming to John, Thus, Jesus said to John, It becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. In the Bhagavad Gita, the fourth chapter, Sri Krishna says, Open thyself to those who have attained wisdom. They will be thy teachers. Ask questions of them, both verbally and mentally. Serve them faithfully and with devotion. How is the devotee to recognize one who has attained wisdom? The Bhagavad Gita gives us this inspiring description of the sage. By this sign is he known, being of equal grace to comrades, friends, chance comers, strangers, lovers, enemies, aliens, and kinsmen, loving all alike, evil or good. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. from Whispers from Eternity. Um, teach me to store honey of good qualities from all soul flowers in the honeycomb of my heart. In the summer days of life, teach me to gather honey from the flowers of all spiritual qualities that blossom in the garden of truthful souls. I will store the perfume of forgiveness in the honeycomb of my heart the lotus fragrance of humility, myrrh-scented devotion, 
the rare honey of all soul qualities. And even though the snowflakes of wintry experiences and earthly separations whirl about me, I shall seek thee in the honeycomb of my heart, where often I have found thee stealing the stored honey of my devotion. Wherever thou hast come, in every place hallowed by thy feet, I will lie touching thy footprints. Ah, there alone will I find a place of true safety. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> a number of years ago, let me, let me try to get this clear. I think this was, the, uh, a, a Swami came to visit uh, where we were living, American man who was, had been living in India for many years, where I'm hesitating is he had a film, and he had a film, and I think it was Swami Shivananda. It was not Ananda Ma. That's where my hesitation was. But it doesn't really matter, because the saint that was walking was not the, the part of the film that has stayed with me for all this time. It was just one, some black and white film. Somebody had the idea that this is Swami Shivananda, who was a, 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 gr a great, uh, I think his disciples might consider him an avatar. He was certainly a God-realized man, and he lived in India in recent times. Swami Kriyananda met him. He's, he uh, founded the Divine Life Society in Rishikesh. He's a wonderful, noble man. And so he had disciples. He was Indian. He lived in Rishikesh, and so all the, it was, it is still, it's a wonderful Indian scene, and it, during the time that Shivananda was alive, all these ascetics would come out of the mountains to see him. They were either his disciples or they were, well, they were his disciples, and that's why they were coming. And you just had that marvelous, uh, complete indifference to human life in the way they dressed, in the way they behaved. So somebody thought it would be a good idea to run this black and white camera and watch this scene. So you, you're watching the camera, and Shivananda walks by like this. But what came next on the camera is one of these hoary ascetics, you know, big, powerful man, falls on the ground and rolls in his footprints. Just like that, rolls in his footprints. And there wasn't, there wasn't uh, even on the film, you could feel, there wasn't the slightest affectation about it. There was no, I'm going to impress everyone. There was no, oh, I've read somewhere this is a good idea. You could feel the absolute authenticity based on his own inner experience that the dust itself is sanctified because the feet of my guru have touched it, and I want to take every bit of that into us. Now, what do we do? <laughs> you know, with realities like this, where it just takes everything that our little minds have trained us to understand and the way we think of ourselves and our self-definitions, and then it just gets completely turned over, rolling in the dust where the guru has walked. Now, one of the things that is difficult as time passes is we tend to want to express our devotion to those that we have loved. Um, I read a, a book about Ramakrishna, and I've read many different books about Ramakrishna. He was an avatar of the 1800s. He passed away just about the time that Yogananda was born. I don't think their lives overlapped at all. The end of the 1800s, he passed away. He lived in a temple devoted to Kali near Calcutta. Many of you have visited there, you know. And uh, wait just a moment, I have to find the thought again. Oh, yes. And the book uh, was a book of myths about, about Ramakrishna. <laughs> it was just, frankly, this is not a factual biography. This is a book of myths. <laughs> but what was so interesting to me, reading the introduction, was that the author was explaining how sometimes myths are more true than facts, because we're feeling deep within ourselves something that when we just try to put ordinary words on it, you know, Master was 
uh, five foot six, and he weighed a certain a number of pounds, and he spoke his first language was Bengali, and he had four brothers and sisters. You just feel like, what? You know, what does this have to do with what I know to be true? And so he was explaining how, in an effort to be more factual, or to say to be more truthful, we become less and less factual because facts are too dull and truth is so dynamic. So these were all stories, and you know, certainly Krishna and the life of Jesus. But now I want to bring it back to a different reality, because we are like third generation of Master, fourth generation coming, where Master was there, there were those who lived with him and knew him, and then there were those of us who knew someone who knew him, and then there's those of you who knew someone who knew him, knew someone who knew him, you know, you can see how it goes. And as time passes, we, we tend to want to, to it, out of sincere desire to be truthful, we start elevating, and then we start losing the dimensions. And in the life of Master, there's one dimension that is exceedingly important for us to hold, and because Swami made this clear, I'm beginning to understand it, we elevate Master, we talk about him as our guru, you know, or my guru, however we're thinking, which is all perfectly appropriate. But we don't understand that he considered himself a disciple. And there was no contradiction in his taking responsibility for all of us, for understanding our thoughts. When Swamiji was confronted with a correction from Master, when Swami Kriyananda had, was just a young monk and had said something that Master thought was an irresponsible comment in a setting where Master was nowhere around. And then he says to Swami later, you know, that really it wasn't the best way to handle that situation. Swami's response was, and he, he writes in honestly in his autobiography, you knew? And Master just looked at Swami and said, I know every single thought you think. Oh. <laughs> now, Swamiji was courageous enough to say he was glad of that. I don't know if all of us are glad of that. But I asked Swami the obvious question, trying to be neutral, is that still true? You know? And then Swami looked at me and said, of course. Of course it's true. We're, we're transparent. To, the, to these souls, and they take responsibility. What do we do in the purification ceremony, which most of you, many of you, have participated in, you at least know. You, we say, the devotee says, I want purification. I want the grace of God, or at least I want to want the grace of God, or maybe even I want to want to want, you know, whatever, however it is, we're as sincere as we're capable of being. Master says, open your heart to me and I will take charge of your life. I mean, that's a big, that's a big promise for a fairly small ask. So there's no uh, limitation to the master's willingness and ability to step into our lives individually. The human mind just breaks. Don't even try. Just take their word for it. You know, we are individually observed, loved, watched, and guided. But Master, and Swami writes this in the path, Master himself, remember that scene, some of you, most of you have read it. Swami says he's sitting at the lunch table with Master with a bunch of, with a group of guests who were not disciples, who were newer. And someone says to Master, they're just having a very genial conversation. If you really read between the lines, Master was extremely natural. He was not at all pretentious. He was very humorous. Swami actually said, outside of the path, he said, Master was adorable, was the word he used. He said, and he even actually said, he was so cute. He said, how could I write that in the path? You know, it's just like, there was no way to say it that didn't um, miss the point. It becomes factual, but not truthful. But what he meant, he was so lovable. And he was so lovable in a way that caused you not to feel afraid 
but to feel like you were with your very own and completely relaxed. But Master never stopped being a disciple. Swami tells us the story of uh, the man, the, the, the man who gathered walnuts from the road in order to gather money, and then he sold the walnuts and he bought yarn. I mean, just you, you see this whole story of this older man who was probably solitary, who, who loved uh, Master. He gathered walnuts from the road that were just the gleanings. He sold them to get money. He bought yarn and he hooked a rug. I, you know, you have, you have these tiny little vignettes, and many of you have read the, the path, the new path it is now. When Swami uh, wrote that book, it was the last book he wrote before he had a computer to write with. And so I had the extraordinary privilege of typing that book, that manuscript, over and over and over. So I know the book. <laughs> well, I, and I know that story. But thinking about it just this morning, I said, I don't know that story. I never put myself into the position of that, that elder man. And where, where did he sit when he hooked that rug? And so then he hooked a rug, which was a picture of Sri Uteshwar. Even just that, like, you're hooking a rug that's a picture of Sri Uteshwar? Like, where does all this come from? He presents it to Master, the, 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 the devotion to Guru that is so deep in all of that, and the power of that devotion to compel um, actions from us that nothing else could compel. And he gives it to Master. Master hangs it outside his room. So think of the, all of the force that was there the way the disciple loved Master, the fact that that disciple wanted to give Yogananda a picture of his guru. It's like, what would be precious to you? I mean, all of that was there. It's just right there in that little story, if we stop and think about it. Every in a grain of sand, infinity is in a grain of sand. And then Master, as Swami writes, Every time he would go in and out of his room, he would prono to that picture. Because Master knew who he was. He was the product of Sri Yukteswar's training. Well, Babaji's training, truthfully, Master's guru was really Babaji, but he was sent to Sri Yukteswar. Babaji wanted him in this incarnation to have Sri Yukteswar as the manifested form. And without the, the slightest sense of how important we think Yogananda is, he saw himself as he truly was. And back to the lunch table, which we abandoned some time ago. Swami said that one of the visitors said to Master, I understand Dr. Lewis was your first disciple in America. And what Swamiji writes is the entire atmosphere changed. They were just, you know, pass the potatoes. Would you like more gravy? How is you milk for your tea? Because he was just talking about Master being a host. Master would uh, set the table. Um, they, they had the little Hollywood church or whichever church it was. And after the service, they would put a dining table out on the dais because that was the only places they had. And Master would relate to, the, they invite the guests to lunch. So they're all just sitting there, just being friends. As soon as that question was asked, Swami describes how Master's complete mood shifted. And then he said, that's what Master answered. He said, that's what they say. Like, how would he not know? But that's what they say. And Swami said that discipleship was too precious a relationship to just be like conversation at the table. And Master himself did not say, well, yes, you know, being a God-realized Master, the last of the line, you know, I'm the one. So, and then been lots of them afterwards, you know, I mean, that's how the human mind works. Master, I mean, it was inconceivable. And then Master said, you know, they're God's disciples. They're not mine, they're God's disciples. Now, 
this is the magnificent paradox that we're working with all the time. Because God does send us these personifications, these e exemplary examples of what it means. You know, Swami Kriyananda, which we all know, I don't have to identify myself in relation to him. There he is. And he, ex he showed us what it means to be a disciple. That's all, because that's what we are. We don't have to worry about being gurus. We have to worry about being disciples, because that's how it's done. But Master himself exemplified what it was to be a disciple. Jesus exemplified what it was to be a disciple. We lose track of what they're really teaching us. And that's, you know, the, in the whole scene in the Bible when uh, Jesus is encountering John the Baptist baptizing at the river, and Jesus is uh, coming out of his seclusion, I believe. And I, now I might lose my sequence. I think he was coming out of his long seclusion, or maybe he was just going into it, whichever side it was. And, you know, and there's a whole scene going on. John the Baptist is this enormously influential being and a God-realized master in his own right who's making big waves in the society there. And then Jesus is also wandering around making a lot of noise in people's minds. And there's this huge kerfuffle going on with the whole thing. And so then the two of them meet, like, what's going to happen now? And, and John the Baptist, just because of the interesting drama that was going on at that time, he says, well, I'm not worthy to baptize you. Now, he, because Jesus and John are now equals, but Jesus says, to fulfill all righteousness. And it's a very small phrase, but Master tells us what it means, which is Jesus knew that everything he was came from his guru, and so there was no separation. So he allowed, not didn't allow, he compelled John the Baptist to baptize him. Just like that. And this is what, this is what real, it's not even humility. It's just recognizing the way things are. This is just the way things are. When Master was asked once a simple question about, actually, I think the question had to do with, why do you send your young disciples to public schools? If I'm not mistaken, it was a question like that. It was a very mundane question. Whatever it was, it was very mundane. Somebody asked Master, why do you do it this way? Master said, because it was the will of Babaji. I mean, he didn't have to say this. I mean, he could have reasoned it all out afterwards, because he certainly knew. But he thought the answer to that question is my guru wants me to do it this way. When Swamiji was a new disciple at Mount Washington, and a week earlier, he didn't know anything about this reality until he picked up autobiography of a yogi, recognized, he said, in, in conversation, I don't think Swami put this into a book, maybe he did, but I, in, I, had, I had the words. Swamiji described, as he often described at the end of his life, you all remember, that's all he talked about. You could give him any topic you wanted, but you knew what the subject was going to be. <laughs> and he, you know, we, we, we weren't actually laying bets, but you could see how long will it take him before he starts telling us about finding autobiography and being initiated by Master. Because I think in his brilliant mind and all the work that Swami had done and following the Master's commission to him to do this great work and looking at it having been done, he could, all Swami himself could remember was the main event. I'm a disciple of a great master. When someone asked him when he wrote the material success course, what's the difference between your course? And I think they actually said Tony Robbins, who was, you know, I think that was the comparison. But it was, what's the difference between your, your material success course and all the other choices that you have out there, of which there was, are zillions? Swami said, said it, he said it also like this. I'm the disciple of a great master. I, mean, I have really meditated on that answer a lot. And that actually, that's become a little mantra of mine. I'm the disciple of a great master. And not like I'm the disciple, but I'm the disciple of a great master. 
You know, you, you, you just start with tiny little words and then you go into those words. Now, I was going somewhere else. Let me see if I can remember it. Um, Oh yes, Swami said when he was a new monk there, and he was just staggering under the magnitude of how his life had changed. I mean, just consider that when you, that's why Swami wrote his autobiography. He wanted us to see what discipleship really is. And he also wanted us to see that discipleship is not for weaklings. It's not weaklings trying to find a safe haven. It's people who have gone to the limit of their own power and recognize that there has to be a power greater than this. But Swamiji bowed his head to no one until he found someone to bow his head to. And what he said was, Swamiji said, when, among the many reasons why autobiography moved him so deeply, he said, I always felt that I lived in a world that I lived alone in a world that no one else shared. And he tells us the stories of how he just perceived the world and how he lived, and the astral world was more real to him than this world. It was only at the age of nine when he became physically very ill. And also he, again, these are things, well, when he wrote The Path, his parents were still living, and he was very respectful of his parents. But there was another part of it was, one of the reasons that he changed a little bit the age of nine was because he began to realize that he lived in a world of his own and no one shared it. And he said it was particularly emphasized between the difference between himself and his father. And Swami was a much desired firstborn son. And his father was deeply devoted, I mean, as a father. Um, but Swami could feel the the inherent heartache of the fact that his father's world was not his world, but he also began to be a little afraid because, is, do I belong anywhere? And that's when he began, if you read his autobiography, to try to fit in to the world around him. And pr prior to that, <clears throat> Swami would go to sleep by seeing a great light in front of him. And then that light would expand, and Swami would merge into that light. I mean, I think we're talking from when he was a baby. But it's, it's you come into this world, and this is your experience. It doesn't cross your mind that this isn't what everybody's doing. Everybody goes to sleep. Everybody sees the great light. Everybody merges in the great light. So it took him to around the age of nine before he began to realize this isn't happening. But he began to think that there was something wrong with him, or to be you know, it's a, these great souls <clears throat> have to take on some karmic drama. Otherwise, their lives don't mean anything to us. You know, of course, you could do it. You're a master. But we have, to, we have to see the ups and downs of karma. So, but when he read Autobiography of a Yogi, again, just think about this. He realized that Master lived in the same world he lived in. You know? When I met Swami Kriyananda, and he walked into this tent, actually, as it were, but the hall where there was a lecture to be given, um, he walked in. He didn't speak. He hadn't yet spoken. He walked in, and I saw someone that I wanted to be. And I had never seen anyone that I wanted to be. I mean, of course, I had wonderful people in my life. I was gifted in that way. But I never saw anyone I wanted to be. And all of a sudden, I saw someone I wanted to be. Now, it changes everything, doesn't it? That, that's the divine play, that masters, the, 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 the masters come. And they come, and they essentially, they radiate. They exemplify. And then they do lots of other interesting stuff. But what they really do is they sing the note of freedom and bliss. And our hearts recognize it as the melody we're seeking. God bless you.
Just a brief word on this piece. This is Swami's song from the album Secrets of Love. And the title is Love is the Dream of Infinity. So as we listen to this piece, let's try to tune into that message, that dream of infinity. (laughs) 